So what, in your view, would be the most sensible marijuana policy? Um, well, there's a family of policies, but Stan Glantz, whom I disagree with pretty radically on tobacco policy, said what I think is the right thing to say about cannabis policy, which is that it ought to re resemble our tobacco policy, current tobacco policy, more than it resembles our current alcohol policy. Right? So our current alcohol policy is this drug is legal, adults enjoy it, kids aren't supposed to use it, some people get in trouble with it, we'll offer them treatment and don't drive drunk. Right? That's our alcohol policy. Um, if you look at the annual report of a state alcohol beverage control commission, they won't have any statistics about the health damage from alcohol. They won't have any statistics about drunk driving, right? Their job is making sure that the stores pay their taxes, that the premises are maintained orderly, there's no sales to minors, right? That's their job. They're not in the public health business. They may have a alcohol abuse prevention program off on the side, mm -hmm. but it's not their stated policy to reduce the number of people who drink a lot. In the smoking case, it's the stated policy of the federal government and most state governments and most governments around the world to reduce the number of people who smoke. Most of us don't want to do that by full prohibition, but pretty much anything short of that is fair game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want to keep raising taxes so that people will smoke less. That would be a sensible view to take about cannabis, right? So <clears throat> how can you make it a, a, available to adults for moderate use while discouraging heavy use and use by minors? Well, that's a bunch of things pop up. One is keep it expensive. Right now, the amount of cannabis that it would take a, a naive user, somebody without a tolerance, to get stoned costs about $2, a reasonable number. Much less in some of the states that have legalized, right? So there's now very potent stuff available, very cheap in Washington. Um, but the pre-legalization price was about about $2 for about three hours of intoxication. It's already a pretty good deal compared to beer. If you look at the stuff that's now available in Washington, there's one of the store in Seattle, offers what it calls budget bud. 18% THC cannabis, horse trimmed, um, for $95 an ounce. Right, so that's $3 and change a gram that's about 15 cents a stoned hour. Um, that seems to me a ridiculously low price. And if you're a, an occasional user, if you like to get stoned on Saturday night, and by the way, I know of no evidence that getting stoned on Saturday night is bad for you. I mean, there may be some, I just don't, don't know where it is. If you do that, the difference between the $2 it would cost to get stoned when the stuff's illegal and the 45 cents it would cost to get stoned if it's legal isn't material to you. After all, the Doritos cost more. If you smoke four joints every day, which there are a couple million people who do that, the price matters. So as Phil Cook says about alcohol, the argument for the, t the high price is that it doesn't matter to the people using responsibly, and it puts a crimp in the people who are using dangerously. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is keep the price up, which the Dutch did, by the way. The Dutch legalized the, the retailing end, but not the production end. So as the, the Dutch say, the front door of the coffee shop is legal, but the back door is illegal. The pot fairy has to deliver the pot. The result is that Dutch coffee shop pot costs what German illicit pot costs. Surprise, surprise, their heavy use rate has not gone up. So price is key, marketing is key, and two halves of that. One is what are the companies allowed to say to sell the stuff? And the other is what are they required to say? So one of my, seems to me pretty obvious recommendations is that because cannabis is complicated uh, and because legalization brings new users in, uh, the people at the other, on the other side of the counter, the, the, the sales clerks, well, the, they're called bud tenders now, Right now, they're mostly guys with ponytails who are being paid the minimum wage. Um, well, A, their advice to you about your cannabis use is likely to be conditioned by their own cannabis use, which is extremely heavy. B, they don't know anything. Um, so why not require that the clerks have pharmacology training um, and have substance abuse prevention training and have a, fiduciary a license of fiduciary responsibility to give advice to the consumer for the consumer's benefit and not for the store owner's benefit.
I, I don't see any interference with liberty in that. Um, but you pharmacists do that sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and and one possibility is to require people to have pharmacy training. Um, so that would help. Um, and but the other problem is that the industry is going to have a very strong interest in preventing any kind of restriction that would limit the size of the problem, right? Because the, sure. the, the people who are the problem from your perspective and mine are the target market right. from the dealer's perspective, whether that dealer is legal or illegal. And so you're going to see the cannabis industry lobbying heavily against any effective substance abuse prevention. So one question is, should we have a cannabis industry, right? Why not make it a state store system? Uh, why not require it to be co-ops? Um, and there are a number of designs. Uh, uh, Bo Kilmer and his, and his colleagues at RAND put out a report for the governor of Vermont. It's terrific on this point. They identified 12 policies that are in, in between. We can link to it. Hmm? We'll link to that. Between legalization and prohibition. So we're now in the position of lurching from an unworkable prohibition to the most extreme commercial legalization mm -hmm. without stopping in the middle. 